to start, I just want to remind you of Limud's next eLimud event on the 25th of October, and I hope we're going to see you all there. Right, uh, welcome back everyone to Limud Live in the South African Jewish Report and the SS Officers Armchair in Search of a Hidden Life. My name is Jocelyn Rome and I'm your host for the session. And as this is online, we still would like people to participate by posting questions in the chat, um, bearing in mind our Limud values of respect and arguments for the sake of heaven. Um, and please note this session is being recorded, so you do have it for security purposes, and you will have an opportunity to see the videos afterwards. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our presenters for the session, Daniel Lee and Tally Nates. Daniel is a historian of World War II and an expert on the history of Jews in France and North Africa during the Holocaust. Daniel will launch his widely anticipated book, The SS Officer's Armchair, which is a remarkable account of daily life in the Third Reich based on documents that were found concealed in a simple chair for 70 years. The minute we heard about this, we knew that Daniel had to launch this book at Limud and the South African Jewish Report Saturday night event. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. We are sure that many people will want to buy this book after the presentation. And tonight, Daniel will be in conversation with Tully Nates, who is well known to our community. Tully is the founding director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. She's a Limud veteran and was a driving force as a volunteer and presenter in the early years of Limud South Africa and remains one of the more popular local presenters we have. Tali, tonight you make history. You're the first presenter who has done two Elimwood events. Welcome. We'll have a 40 minute presentation and five minutes of the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, it is wonderful to be with all of you tonight and to have the official launch of this amazing, amazing book, The SS Officers Armchair. And uh, Daniel, it's wonderful to be in conversation with you. And uh, as I said before in the teaser, you know, I could not put the book down. I, I read it in preparation of our conversation and I just thought what a wonderful, wonderful book. It is really a detective work. You know, it's a thriller at parts uh, that I was waiting to see what will you discover? Um, your amazing research across Europe and the United States uh, tracing people, tracing homes, uh, streets, and, and uh, finding family members uh, out of almost nowhere. It, it was absolutely amazing. And of course, your fantastic imagination to fill in the gaps in the story using other sources such as soldiers' letters from, from the front or diaries or, or just filling up the history of the Third Reich, history of anti-Semitism, early anti-Semitism, uh, racism in the United States, and a lot of research that went into this amazing, amazing book. Now, as you said in the teaser, when we think about perpetrators during the Holocaust and the Second World War, we tend to think about, of course, the leaders, uh, Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, uh, or other desk killers that are very familiar to, familiar to us, uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, Hans, Hans Frank, or, you know, as, as someone very deeply in the, the, the history of the Holocaust, of course, we, we think of the genocide uh, through the commanders of, 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 uh, of camps or the Einsatzgruppen heads, uh, concentration camp guards, you know, this is sort of what we think when we think about the Holocaust. So we're not surprised to hear the story of Franz Stengel for Treblinka or Rudolf Hirsch from Auschwitz or, or even Ollendorf from the Einsatzgruppen. But we do not know the ordinary Nazis. We do not know the smaller ranking uh, party members, uh, SS, uh, people that belong to the SS, or the Gestapo, names that we know, but we don't know much about. 
So your story is unique as it tells the story of an unknown person to all of us. And actually, if you guys, all 300 of you, Google the name of Robert Griesinger, you will not find him because he was not known until this book. So this is his story. And it is the story that you uncovered through your research over the years. So to start, Daniel, can you tell us a little about yourself and how you stumbled upon this story and then wrote this book? Thank you so much, Tali. That was an extremely generous uh, introduction and I'm touched by all the wonderful things you've, you've said about my book. So that means a lot, so thank you. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a British historian of the Second World War. My last book, was on Jews in Nazi occupied France. So I'm a, a French historian by training, and I'm also interested and I've written about the Jews of North Africa during the Second World War. So to answer the question about how and why I decided to write about this one guy, essentially the story came to me. I, had, I was living in Florence doing research there. Uh, and one day somebody just came up to me and said, oh, I've heard about you. You're a historian of the Second World War. I need your help something just happened to my mother. And I was just thinking, God, how extraordinary, you know, how could something have just happened to your mother, you know? Um, anyway, and she, she just went on to explain how her mother had purchased this old armchair in the 1960s. She was a student, she was living in Prague, she was, she was Czech. And she basically had, had, had went to a few thrift stores in Prague, she didn't have much money, she just got a few objects, including this armchair. And then when the family were allowed to leave communist Czechoslovakia in the 1980s, they could take certain objects with them when they migrated to the Netherlands. And so they, they took this chair, they'd had the chair for years. And then just a few years ago, having had the chair for, for almost 50 years, she decided to get it reupholstered. And that's when the reupholsterer discovered inside the, the cushion of the armchair, all of these documents covered in swastikas, all belonging to one man, Robert Griesinger. And she had no idea how the documents ended up in her armchair. She had purchased the chair. It wasn't a relative or anything like that. So she just brought them to me and she said, well, who is this man? And how on earth did his documents end up inside my armchair? So that's how I, I got into this story. I just, as you said at the beginning, I Googled him, I went online, I just tried to find out in a few books, whatever I could about this man. And there was just absolutely nothing. You know, as you say, we know so much, there's been so much written about the men at the top, the people, you know, Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich, et cetera. But when we start to really look for the people who actually, the, 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 the millions of nameless, faceless followers. Oh, thank you, Ariella. So um, here's a photo we have of, um, of the chair itself. And then, uh, so it's a very ordinary 1930s armchair. That's the bedroom in which it was discovered, uh, the documents all sewn into the cushion. And then the next image we have is one of the documents uh, which I've chosen to show you tonight, which is, uh, which shows straight away who this man was, um, a little, a couple of things that I found interesting about him. Perhaps we'll see that in a moment. Um, and Daniel, maybe can you tell us about the reaction of the upholsterer in Amsterdam? Because well, the, the, yeah, the up, up, so interesting. But for an upholsterer in Amsterdam, this isn't something that they discover every day. Uh, so he was genuinely shocked and actually quite appalled by the documents that he had all of a sudden in, in his fingers. Uh, you know, he thought that this woman was the daughter of a Nazi or a relative or had inherited this chair or something like that. And he accused her of, you know, oh, I don't do work for Nazis or their family. What is this? You know, you're a Nazi or whatever, something like that. She was genuinely flabbergasted. She had absolutely no idea who this man was or how his documents ended up in the chair. And from looking at this, this document, one of, as I said, these were the most personal, deeply private identity papers, the kinds of thing you could not live without. The first document started, was dated from 1933 and the last one from 45. So again, I just went, what I did was I went to the archives in the Czech Republic, in Prague, and I just began digging. I wanted to know everything I could about this man and about his armchair. Absolutely, and, and all those documents that he, we assume hid in that armchair, but we'll get there. Uh, how did the story unfold and what did you find out uh, is really fascinating. So this Robert, Gr uh, 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 Grissinger that 
as you said, you never heard of, was born in Stuttgart in 1906, and he died on the 27th of September, 1945, in a hospital in Prague. Now, I would like to explore with you this man, his career in the SS, in the Gestapo, his serving in the Wehrmacht, uh, in Poland and the Ukraine, and finally, uh, his posting in Prague in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia in the Ministry of, of Economics and Labor. And I would like to do it because we can spend three hours, five hours on this, but we sadly have only <laughs> 35 minutes or even less. So let's do it through the prism of his links to the targeting of the Jews um, in Nazi Germany. But let's start maybe by speaking about his family background and some of the conservative and anti-Semitic views his family and he, he himself held and how is his story connected to the history of racism, mm. uh, specifically, specifically about his family's roots in New Orleans in the US. Yeah, no, I'm pleased you, you've mentioned that. Actually, Ariella, if we could possibly go to the next image, that would be really helpful. Um, because the point I want to make about uh, Griesinger in relation to this question is that he came from a very, very middle class family. He was what a lot of historians now see as being very typical of a member of the SS, this middle class, university educated, often with a PhD, Protestant uh, background. So he, he sort of had all of these attributes. Um, he ticked every box for, for, for membership of the sort of the typical uh, SS member. But no, it was extremely uh, surprising to me. Okay, so here what we see is a, a photo of his mother's diary, one of the most amazing sources I managed to find was, a, was his mother's diary. She wrote every single day uh, in her diary. And, he, and she often included photos and newspaper extracts that she found interesting. So here's just, you know, a glimpse of what, you know, the young middle class, upper middle class family would have looked like at that time. So it, what was very, what was amazing one, when I discovered it was contrary to everything I had thought I knew about Nazi Germany that, you know, we all, that Germans had had been in that Nazis had been in Germany for generation after generation after generation. Griesinger's father was actually American. Griesinger's father was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and had actually moved to Imperial Germany at the late nineteenth century when sort of uh, there was an economic slump in the U.S. South after the Civil War and Reconstruction. So Germany looked sort of much more. Uh, it offered more prospects for the family back then. So his when tracing this family all the way back to the 1720s in Louisiana, what I what I really what I kept finding was the, the multiple links his family had with slavery and the ways in which so many members of his family owned enslaved people, even Griesinger's grandmother, who he was very close to, his grandmother Lena. Uh, she moved to Stuttgart with them. So she was born and bred in America and she moved to Stuttgart uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, and she grew up with an enslaved person in her house, uh, for example. So what I'm trying to get at is that in the, in the context uh, of his background, the 1860s, the 1870s, this was a really important time for white supremacy, the emergence of white supremacy in the American South. And this was heavily interlinked with Griesinger's family. So when, for example, Griesinger's father decided to build a new house in Stuttgart, you know, I, I went to the archives, I got the plans of the house and I'm looking at them in my hands because the house looked like nothing whatsoever. It looked like something out of the American South with all these columns and pillars at the entrance. It looked like none of the other houses in Stuttgart. And this is something that his father deliberately wanted. He wanted a reminder of his heritage from Louisiana. And then, uh, yes, then yeah. it was a second then, part of your question. Yes, so, so maybe then he's born in 1906. What kind of young man, child yeah. was he? What, what was his background, uh, the family, the, the, the uh, and maybe if you now can link to racism and anti-Semitism. So. Yeah, so, so, so he was born in this extraordinary de decade, this decade between 1900 and 1910. And the reason that's such an amazing 
decade when we think about the Second World War and the Holocaust is that it was a generation which we as historians, we call the, the war youth generation. These were guys and obviously women, but the men who were later to join the Nazi party and, and rise through it had been too young to fight in the First World War. And the First World War was, the, was something that totally, totally marked them because let's not forget, Germany had not been invaded. They didn't have to live under a brutal occupation during the First World War. A lot of these people, um, I'll get to this photo later, but um, a lot of these people who were children during the First World War, when the, when the Allies suddenly won, when Germany was uh, had to sign this peace deal, it was sort of, it was the collapse of everything that they had known, all the certainties of life. It was total devastation for them. It was, uh, it, it was something that just marked them forever. Okay, and this was really important for people like Griesinger and of his class. It was, you know, the Jews, the communists, they had brought Germany to defeat in World War I. These were the things that, um, you know, we, they needed to fight against at all costs in order to build a strong and resurgent uh, Germany once again. In terms of the Jewish population, it's interesting because you say, as you say, he came from Stuttgart, but Stuttgart, it's not Frankfurt, it's not Berlin, it doesn't have a significant Jewish population. There were only maybe 4,000, maybe five total max uh, Jew Jewish people living there at the time. So Griesinger wouldn't have interacted so much with, with Jewish people, although from looking at his, his school records, we do see that there was a Jewish boy in his class at school whose family I managed to to track down. Uh, so he did have some interaction at school uh, with Jews because of course there were maybe, I think there was something like 20 Jews in his entire school of 500. So very, very small amount, but everybody knew who the Jewish kids were. The Jewish kids, it said on the register what, what religion the children were. Um, the Jewish children wouldn't have gone to the religious classes. So there was always, of course, it was always known who was uh, who was Jewish at the time. But this is it really at university. So from 1925 onwards, when Griesinger goes to Tübingen University, one of the most extreme right nationalist universities in Germany at the time. And that's when he gets really involved with some of these far right uh, nationalist movements, hugely anti-Semitic, anti-communist, etc. Uh, and this is something that comes up time and time again in his mother's diary, the extent to which, you know, she's obviously of the of the right herself, but she's constantly commenting on her son's politics being even too right wing by her tastes, which were extremely uh, nationalist. Absolutely. And, and of course, the photo that very briefly went about his famous scar and uh, that is also the university days. The, Absolutely. This masculinity, this it manly so, class. <laughs> it was so important. So for Griesinger, in the very first photo that you saw of him in his passport photo, he's got this scar on his face. And I was very struck by that. And I did wonder how he had gotten this, how he had obtained the scar. But it was really through looking at the records he, of these, all of these right wing fraternities in Germany at the time, it was, it was, as you say, the sign of masculinity to have a scar. So it was almost, you know, to be encouraged that he would sort of pick up his sword and his opponent would have his sword. And then, you know, he would sort of like, you know, edge towards it. He would want some of his flesh to be torn from his face so that then he would get some salt and put the salt in the wound to appear, uh, you know, much more manly. And that's, this is something which was extremely common in, in, in right-wing societies, dueling societies, university groups in the 20s and in the 30s. Yeah, and also it's something that is not spoken about much, you know, when you try to understand German society uh, during the Weimar days, you do not talk about all those uh, fraternities in the male universities. Uh, that later you speak about the other universities, not only Tübingen, but uh, Leipzig and, and the other universities. Um, let's just move a little bit further when he is joining now the SS. The, the Nazis come to power, it is 1933, and um, Robert joins the SS in September 1933. And he actually rises to sort of mid uh, rank, he's, he's never top rank in the SS is uh, Oberstumführer, uh, that is his, uh, his highest rank. But 
I would like you now to take us to the time when he's actually in the Gestapo. Because yeah. this is something that we we read about, but we let's talk about his time in Stuttgart, in Hotel Silber, yeah. and, uh, and talk about him. But now, Daniel, speak also about some of his colleagues, because it's really interesting what happened to some of his colleagues. Yeah. So, so Griesinger is, he, he joins, as you say, he joins the SS quite late. He joins in September 33. And the reason that he joins quite late is because he probably hadn't been a member of the Nazi party. Well, he wasn't. He definitely was not a member of the Nazi party. As I've said, his class, his background, people like, like him didn't necessarily join the Nazi party. There were plenty of other right-wing anti-Semitic parties which he could have joined. Um, so the Nazis for him might have been too rabble rousing, too vulgar or something like that at first. And also let's not forget the Southwest Stuttgart. It took a very long time for the Nazis to really take off there uh, and to make progress. Even in the 1930s ele 30 election, they had done quite poorly in the Southwest. So Griesinger probably came to Nazi, did come to Nazism very, very late compared to others. That's why he joins the SS because he, he's no longer able to become a party member. Um, they basically, the Nazis decided in spring 1933 that membership was not no longer uh, to, uh, uh, afforded to everybody. So he joins the SS. As you say, he doesn't ever particularly rise up that high. But what's interesting tracing his career is like how he gets into these positions and when he gets into these positions, because it really is up to him uh, the amount of involvement he chooses to invest in the organization. It's not as though he has to go every day or once a week. It's sort of he decides how much, you know, whether uh, the level of interests that he invests into the organization. So it's not a full-time career for him. He's a lawyer, he's a civil servant. And in 1936, he, in 1935 rather, he gets posted to the Gestapo in Stuttgart. And he works at this enormous building, the Hotel Silber in the center of Stuttgart. Um, and of course in 35, 36, the regime is targeting Jews. I think had he a job, but 33, 34, I think the Gestapo were much more interested in looking, rounding up local communists, social democrats, trade unionists, etc. But by the time Griesinger joins in 1935, 36, that's when uh, the regime is really looking at how to persecute uh, the Jewish population in a way it hadn't done until then. So Griesinger joins this group of lawyers. They're all wearing ordinary suits every day to work. They're not wearing SS uniform or anything like that. And he is responsible, him and his group, for making sure that the laws are being carried out locally. Laws which were being decided in Berlin are being put into place throughout the entire state of Württemberg, so beyond Stuttgart. So Griesinger isn't necessarily going out, get, rolling up his sleeves and sort of rounding up Jews himself. But he, boy, is he A, responsible for these atrocities, and B, of course, he knows exactly what's going on, because on, even though he's sitting at his desk with his nice typewriter on the second floor, there are all of these torture cells in the basement that everybody in Stuttgart knows about. Even when I go there and I talk to very elderly people, they're still scared of taking that street, of walking outside the building, the former the Gestapo headquarters, because of, because of the stories they had heard of ch as children about what happened in those torture cellars. So what's really amazing is the way in which these group of lawyers take totally different trajectories, totally different directions from, from a group of five guys who were originally sharing an office in 1935. When we find the same five guys five years later, at the beginning of the occupation, the beginning of the Second World War, they are doing completely different things. And I would argue that Griesinger probably got the short straw. He is probably fed up with the job that he is doing then and looking at his former colleagues who have advanced in the SS and the Gestapo and are doing all these exciting things. And he is just, all he's doing in 1940 is he's sitting on the border between France and Germany waiting for war. He's an ordinary Wehrmacht soldier at that point. So the apple had really fallen far for him and he hadn't taken advantage of a lot of the opportunities he'd been afforded. And it's amazing because he's sitting there uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, implementing the Nuremberg laws, uh, you know, in Stuttgart. And then uh, his colleagues 
those five lawyers, three of them are becoming heads in yeah. the Einsatzgruppen, the killing units that are, uh, you know, actually the one is, is, is killing in Riga and Latvia. And a lot of the Jews, of course, from South Africa are from Latvia and Lithuania. And these are his colleagues. That's that fascinating. I hadn't actually thought of that connection until you're absolutely. now, but you're absolutely right. So Walter Starlecker, who he was extremely close to, Starlecker even was a witness at Gried for Griesinger's wife when, when she wanted to get married. To be an SS bride, you needed to have permission from the SS. And so you had to get all these people to sort of write about your personality and your who you were, etc. So Griesinger got Starlecker um, to be his witness for his wife, to comment on what she was like as a potential SS bride. And then five years later, 1941, Starlecker is responsible entirely as the head of the SS squadrons invading Latvia and murdering the local Jewish population. Absolutely. That for me was immediately, you know, the connection to South Africa and to our community. It was quite unbelievable. Um, so, so, um, we're talking about the Jews. You, you mentioned the Jews of, of Stuttgart. He didn't know many Jews growing up. But in those years, 1936, when he is getting married after some months of, of trying to get married to uh, Gisela, he lives next door to a Jewish couple, to right. Fritz and Helene Rothschild, that right. were quite orthodox, uh, uh, observing Jews uh, in Stuttgart. Tell us a little bit about them. And that is so close to this SS men, you know, that you are investigating. What did you find out about them? Well, I wanted to know um, about how it would have been for someone like Griesinger just to be an ordinary Nazi and to live in Stuttgart. What did it mean at that time? And, you know, you could actually find everybody's names, even Starlecker, someone as important as Starlecker. You could pick up the phone book from Stuttgart in 1935-36 and still find his house. It was very, very easy. But uh, Griesinger, so he got married in spring 1936 and he moved into this beautiful new house. And I, I just wanted to see it. I was very curious to see what it was like. And I checked out who was living next door at the time. Um, Oh, I think Ariel is sharing a photo of, of the wedding day. So that's Griesinger in the middle with his new wife and the parents on either side. So yeah, he, I went to visit this new house because I'd seen in the archives, he lived next door to a Jewish couple called Rothschild. And I was wondering, what does it mean to be in the SS in the Gestapo and to live next door a Jewish family? Does it mean, you know, oh, maybe they're sort of 30 meters apart, the houses or, you know, would there have been a big fence? I was just very curious in terms of space and geography to, to, to get my head around that. But lo and behold, when the family who owned the house today kindly agreed to let me in and have a look around, it was a, a the, the houses were detached. There was just one wall separating the families, which was, which was remarkable to be, uh, to me. And then I eventually managed to track down the, the, the granddaughter of the Rothschild who was able to tell me more about her grandparents and the kind of religious life they would have had. The fact that they would have lit Shabbat candles on a Friday night, they would have had their mezuzah, etc. All of these signs that Griesinger and his wife and children would have noticed over the fence or just going into his house. The two front doors were practically next to one another. But that relationship could only last for so long. Uh, the Rothschilds left um, after Kristallnacht, Fritz Rothschild was rounded up. He was sent to a camp in Germany and then the, fortunately managed to get out and the couple and their son escaped to France and they spent the war in Nazi occupied France until the very end when they were deported and sent to Auschwitz. Yeah, and that was amazing that you managed to trace the, you know, exactly what happened to them, that they went to Drancy and they were sent to Auschwitz on what convoy they were sent just before the Normandy invasion D-Day. And, and um, maybe share what happened. What did you find out? What actually happened to this couple and their son? So the son had already gone into hiding. He hadn't been deported, whereas the parents, who were by then in their late 40s, and so it was very unlikely that they would survive selection, uh, let alone the experience of incarceration in the camp. Um, but ne nevertheless, I discovered that upon arrival, Fritz was sent to the gas chambers, and his wife, who was 
almost 50, nevertheless, obviously must have looked a lot younger because she was one of the few Jewish women on that convoy train who was spared and who was sent to work in the camp. And so she uh, managed somehow to survive. She survived Auschwitz and she returned to Paris um, and then eventually moved to London shortly after the Second World War. And she spent the rest of her life in London. And again, she was able to, to write a lot about what had happened to her and her husband and their life in Stuttgart in documents um, in which she later tried to claim reparations from, from post-war Germany. So I was able to piece together bits of their life through her own voice uh, in the archives. Yeah, so it's just amazing to see these uh, two stories in a way, one next to the other. Let us move now to his time in the Wehrmacht, uh, especially serving in the 25th uh, motorized infantry in June 1941. So you spoke about the unit going to Lublin, uh, seeing the ghetto in Lublin, and then moving to the Soviet Union, uh, the invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa. And yeah. uh, I wonder if you can speak about that period, the, the period in, in, in Poland, in the Ukraine. Of and course. Would you speak about also um, the Wehrmacht role in the killings? And Absolutely. maybe, you know, just extend a little bit about that. And, and finally, maybe speak about your family, sure. your Ukrainian family and the connection. Sure. So, she, so, so yeah, Griesinger, like I've said at the beginning, was not sent to one of these very elitist uh, um, jobs during the, sec the beginning of the war. He was a soldier, but boy, was he resentful. All of his letters from the time, he's complaining, he's trying, he's writing to every contact he had at university, trying to get himself promoted. He wants to be sitting behind a desk somewhere. He does not want to be getting his hands dirty. Uh, as an ordinary soldier. So he spends 1940 in France, and then 1941, his unit gets called up and they're told to go east. Now for them, this was extremely strange because, you know, the Nazis had this, this wonderful uh, pact in place with the Soviet Union. So none of, these, none of these soldiers had any idea why they were heading east. Um, a lot of rumors were going around the t at the time. A lot of them thought, oh, well, we must be going through the Soviet Union. Like perhaps we're going to mandate Palestine or perhaps we're going to the British Raj in India. So a lot of these men, we, we, I can see from the, the sources, from the, from the letters and, and diaries, a lot of these men like went out and they bought books, uh, translation books in like Arabic and Farsi, because the last thing on their mind was that they might be invading the Soviet Union. This was a huge surprise for these men. It was only in June 41 itself, days before, that they actually were told that they were about to do this invasion east. So what we see is Griesinger and his troops headed east from Poland into Ukraine, and just the killing begins straight away. We see, we see villages within, within a few hours of, of obviously Red Army soldiers, but then communists, so-called political, political agitators, and Jews being murdered by Wehrmacht soldiers. And this again, it's something that for years after the Second World War, we were told that, oh, it was only the Einsatzgruppe, it was only the professional killers that killed Jews. You know, German soldiers, we were men, we had honor, we, had a, we conducted a gentlemanly war. We were out to get the Red Army, not the local Jewish population. But again, fortunately, for the last 20 years, we've seen as historians how this myth is no, no longer holds. And that even in Griesinger's exact army unit, time and time again, I'm finding cases of his unit murdering the lo local Jewish population as they advanced east into the Ukraine, into Ukraine, sorry. And again, so you've alluded to this, I was very surprised that my family would have anything what to do whatsoever to do with this story, you know, as a professional historian, you know, I try to write about history, and I don't, I didn't ever think that I would be writing anything about my family. But my, my grandma, my maternal grandmother's father came to Britain from Ukraine, from a small shtetl. And, you know, it, it never occurred to me that Griesinger might even, you know, Ukraine is the largest country in Europe, for goodness sake. But nevertheless, looking at a map, charting his route towards Kiev, I just see his unit suddenly going through this shtetl from which my, my ancestors came. And so it was just amazing to see sort of what was going on in that shtetl at that time in July 1941 as the rain was 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 sort of 
gushing down on his unit and they weren't able to advance the kind of things that they were seeing, the kind of things they were taking part in on the ground as, as they passed the local Jewish population, as they interacted with the local Jewish population. Uh, that was that was really quite uh, quite um, shocking to see uh, what they saw and and to to imagine that he himself is part of this uh, because he is there and there is no doubt that he saw what what uh, what was going on there. Um, we don't have much time, so very very quickly, uh, let's just finally go to his last posting because he's, he's, he's wounded, he goes back to Germany, and then his last posting between 43 and 45 is in Prague in the Ministry of Economics and Labour. Right. And you speak about this period as the one when he is the closest to be a Holocaust perpetrator. And maybe speak to us a little bit about his family, yeah. who is with him in Prague, and what does he do? I mean, Prague was, was his number one choice. It was such a dream posting to be sent to Prague at the beginning of 1943. By that time, bombs had started dropping. The Allies had developed airplanes that could carry bombs to the south of Germany. So Germany was being bombed at that time, whereas Prague was still this beautiful city with German history, German culture, theater, cinema, etc. So for him to be able to get a place for himself and his family in Prague was, would have been a dream come true for him. And that's when he was really able to sort of sit back and think, gosh, I've made it. You know, this is a city for me and for the, for the future, for Germany. So again, like I've said, and we see in this photograph, he brings his wife, he brings his children, the family pet. Um, and he has a very, very good life there. The children obviously go to the best school, the best German schools. They have the best rations, etc. And Griesinger's working every day at the ministry. Again, he's, he's a lawyer at the Ministry of Economics and Labor. And so a lot of what he's doing, and the archives show this very clearly, is he is in charge of making sure that Czech workers are being sent away to do forced labor for the war effort, either in camps in, in um, Bohemia and Moravia, or being sent to Germany and Austria in terrible, debilitating, debilitating conditions. We see time and time again the, from the memoirs of, of the fear, the, 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 the brutality that existed among these Czech workers by the time they got to these camps in Germany. Uh, being, as I said, being bombed every day by allied aeroplanes. Um, it, it was gruesome for them. But again, closer to home, closer to Prague, again, you're having forced labor camps for the local Czech population. By then, <clears throat> by 1943, almost all the Jewish population had already been either incarcerated in Theresienstadt or had been sent, um, sent to killing sites, uh, to concentration camps in Poland. Nevertheless, some did remain, especially those who might have been, had, had one Jewish parent instead of two. And so these Jews would not have been sent, some of these Jews would not have been sent to the camps and these Jews fell under Griesinger's auspices. A lot of these Jews were sent away to do forced labor in sites close to Prague, within a hundred miles of Prague. And these were the people that Griesinger would have been responsible for, along with any other thing that went towards improving the war effort for Germany. So, so we have just a few minutes and I just found it so fascinating, the research that you did, the process, the, the connections that you, you managed to, to, to create, the, uh, the surprising known personalities that are suddenly connected to the story. Friedrich Chopin suddenly appears in your book is connected to the story. Who would have thought, you know? Or von uh, Stauffenberg, you know, uh, the try to kill Hitler is somehow connected to the story. Um, suddenly you, you, you see Adolf Eichmann living in the same city and, and, and so on. So I, I, I want the, the, the listeners to go and buy the book because it is so, so fascinating. So maybe tell us as a final thing, uh, some of the interesting people that you met and maybe speak about, uh, about um, the daughters yeah. that we discovered. 
So no, thank you for that. So what I um sorry, Daniel, can I interrupt? We've got five minutes left. Okay, so that's perfect. Talk, we'll a have quick, time a quick answer. Thank you, Jocelyn. So so yeah, the um to get anything to get any sort of texture in terms of the family into my book, I really, really wanted to know people who had ever spoken to Griesinger, who had known Griesinger. So it was very important to me to try and find any of these people. And what was, you know, he had two daughters, both of whom married, and it found it was really hard to find them. I didn't know what their married names were. So one day I simply had to get the phone book, today's phone book to Stuttgart and just phone every single person in the phone book with the name Griesinger uh, saying, oh, was he a relative perhaps? You know, until somebody said, oh yes, that was my father's brother. And so that's how I managed to get entry to the family. I met his nephew, I went to the house and the nephew told me how to get in touch with the daughters. And so then I managed to meet both his daughters independently one of them lives in Switzerland, the other one still lives in Germany. And throughout the last few years, I've been in a great deal of contact with them regularly, talking to them, interviewing them. And then often they would want to interview me, which as a historian was very, very humbling and very surprising. You know, often I'm the one asking the questions and then I will receive an answer to my question. But here we had this very strange dy dynamic that I would ask my question, they would respond, and then at the end, they would ask me a ton of questions because he, he had died in 1945. The girls had grown up without a father and their mother refused to speak. There was this post-war silence that so many of you will, have know, will, will know about in, in, in Germany from the late 40s into the 50s and 60s where people refused to speak about the war. These girls did not have anyone that they could ask about what their father had done. So here we have a photo, for example, of, of, of Robert with his oldest daughter, Jutta, and his parents. In his uh, in his parents' garden in Stuttgart. Yeah, and, and there were just so many amazing uh, discoveries, and uh, maybe now that we're going to the questions, um, maybe talk about the documents, the armchair, just as as closing, and uh, what is your theory? How did it get into the armchair? <laughs> so I have so many so many possible things to say, much of which is discussed in the book. Um, so we have, to we have to leave people wanting uh, <laughs> a reason to look at it. Absolutely. There are some questions. Jocelyn, will you take some of the questions? And uh, Yeah, uh, I think the, the one question is the one you asked, that everyone wants to know who hid it there, how did it get there, and what happened. And I don't know if there are any more that people want to put in the, the chat. But what a, a fascinating story of a side we don't often hear that literally came out of the woodwork. It and, literally uh, came out of fabric and woodwork. Absolutely. Yeah. So people do want to know how do we get the book? So, um, Daniel, is uh, Book Dealers going to have the books? Can we yes. send people to Book Dealers, to Vivian? I believe so. I believe. I think Vivian's in the room. He, he could hopefully... She <laughs> hopefully tell us but yeah yeah we we try to organize from it's from penguin random i think penguin uh, random house south africa yeah. just came out so i'm sure it will be available at book dealers but most probably also in take a lot and loot and you know all the online uh, shops and uh, i do urge you to buy the book it's uh, it's it's really really fascinating um the way you you know, as I said, found out all those a missing puzzle. Um, do you know if it is on Kindle, people are asking? Yeah, it's definitely available electronically. The one question was, um, what kind of documents did you find and how long did it take you to do the research from the time of meeting the young woman to meeting his daughters? So the, the research took a very long time. It, it started off as sort of, oh, you know, perhaps I'll write, uh, uh, you know, maybe a little article about this. It was never clear to me at the beginning, you know, as I said, I didn't know anything about this man or, or of his life. I wasn't really sure at the start what it was exactly I was after. It was only sort of after pulling certain threads, 
and seeing like the possibilities that were emerging before me that I decided, okay, this is something I need to, to work on. And of course, you know, visiting archives in the Czech Republic, in Germany, in France, and then having to go to Louisiana to look for even more archives took, a, took some years. So overall, it probably took me about five, six years to do the research wow. and to write up uh, what I discovered. Thank you. We are out of time, um, but I see Vivian Newdaking has posted that the book will be available from book dealers in Bluebird. Um, and what a fascinating story. Thank you, Tali and Daniel, for sharing it with us. And uh, just to remind you all, just for your reactions, let's give them a hand or a, a wave, because I think it really was very really meaningful to hear this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at Ilimud in October. Um, Tali is a, a great curator that works with us in curating Holocaust related themes at Ilimud, and I'm sure we will have some very interesting things then too. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and return to the webinar where we're going to have some more schmoozing and some relaxing and talking about this great event. Thank you all. For being Thank with you. us. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Tali. And have a good Thank evening. You, Jocelyn. Thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Jocelyn, Ariella, and Daniel. Thanks. Thank and you, Ariella, for sharing the videos. Thanks, you. Thanks, all of you.